In my lab, we're focused on trying to start off with identifying what are unmet clinical needs. What are better ways that we might be able to screen for certain diseases, diagnose them, and then finally treat them. We specifically focus on the nervous system, this network of highways and roads that we have that innervate most of our body. And we're really interested in trying to develop new ways by which we can use this network to actually tinker with individual organs and individual tissues to see if we can better treat disease. Welcome to my office. I think the nervous system is just so cool. We've been really taught that there's a very traditional way that we get treated. You go to a hospital and you get one of two things, right? You're either prescribed a medication or a pill that you can take, or you undergo some sort of procedure or surgery. Really, if you think about it historically, even those two paradigms have only become common over the last maybe 60, 70 years. And we think about neuromodulation as a potential complementary type of therapy. I think one of the major challenges with interfacing with the nervous system is just how small neurons can be. If you think about a neuron, it is probably a fraction of the size of your hair. We have them in pretty much all the tissues in our body. They all sort of overlap in weird, random, or seemingly random to us ways. One of the major challenges is, well, how exactly do you design approaches from an engineering perspective that allow us to target these neurons specifically without being able to damage any of the tissue around it? So one of the areas that we're really interested in is the GI tract. Our gut has the second largest number of neurons in our body after our brain. And there's been a lot of really cool work over the last few decades focused on how we can better interface with the brain. One of the issues with the brain is that at the end of the day, we're fundamentally limited by the presence of our skull. Our skull basically is good because it protects our brain. It's also bad for us because it makes it really difficult to access our brain if we wanted to affect any of the neurons there. The gut is an entirely different way of thinking about neuromodulation. We like the gut because it technically is non-invasive. If you think about a pill that you swallow, it comes in, goes out, and as long as we don't pierce any membrane or damage any tissues, it is much less invasive than drilling a hole in the skull. One of the really cool things about the gut too is that's also where a lot of different systems in our body sort of reset. We've seen diseases including immune disorders, metabolic diseases, endocrine diseases all start off in our gut. And so you can really think about it as this nexus where all these different tissues interact. And if well, we're designing devices to go in there and interface with neurons, perhaps these devices can do a number of other things as well. Maybe we can interact with the bacteria in the gut and affect how they grow and flourish or die. We can even think about sort of electrical antibiotics instead of having to use them chemically. And it really opens up a broad set of projects that we're really interested in working on. An example of a recent project that we're really excited to share is a device that we call Flash, a ingestible electronic pill. But instead of having drugs on board, what it does is have little tiny electronics embedded in it. And so when you swallow Flash, Flash has these electrodes on its surface that deliver impulses to the lining of your stomach. And in some of the preliminary work that we do, at least in preclinical models, what we find is that these types of interventions can actually change hormone levels. These hormones, the ones that we identified at least, relate to appetite, relate to metabolism, and so you can think about a number of different conditions that might be addressed in this way. When we think about flash or other sort of ingestible electroceutical devices, we are thinking about basically a non-pharmacologic way. So instead of having to administer to the body drugs that were manufactured outside the body, perhaps we can leverage the body's own circuitry for releasing more or less of hormones, for example, that could regulate appetite or metabolism. The way it works is that we deliver this pill with onboard batteries and a tiny little electronic board. On the outside of Flash, we have some electrodes. Once Flash comes into contact with a conductive surface, which is basically our whole body, then Flash begins to deliver little micro zaps of electricity. There are questions around, well, how many people should really be swallowing batteries at all times? And you can insulate them, but at the end of the day, these pills don't necessarily degrade. And once they're excreted, we basically flush them down the toilet. Some of the other sort of engineering innovations that we're working on in lab are trying to rethink some of those assumptions. Can we power these things either externally? Are we able to harvest power from the body to actually give these circuits energy? Can we make these circuits more organic in terms of the materials we use as opposed to making inorganic materials? So there's a lot of really intricate engineering spanning chemistry to mechanical to electrical engineering that goes into designing these. And that's all sort of something that we try to think about in addition to considering what the potential indications and the biology that we're affecting. 
One of the really difficult things about operating in the gastrointestinal tract is that it's this really long tubular structure. When you think about, well, I only want a device to perform a specific function in X location, only in the duodenum or my small intestine, it becomes really important to try to track the device. And this is something that essentially anybody who works in the ingestible space is faced with the same issue. So another interesting project that we worked on with some colleagues at MIT and Caltech we're specifically trying to basically create a GPS system for the GI tract. If we administer a device, how can we track its location at any given time, at any given point in space? In addition to being able to do all this fun engineering and designing of these devices, our end goal is to be able to put this in the hands or in the guts of patients, where we can hopefully improve the way multiple disorders are treated. As optimistic as I am, I think we have to acknowledge that we want to be really careful about what we end up giving to patients and want to make sure that it is absolutely safe before we do so. Some of the ways that we're going about that is having really early collaborations with clinicians and interviews with patients where we actually try to understand a little bit more about what problems they currently experience with the current way that they receive treatment. And that really informs the way that we think about what our solution is. We also collaborate with a team of ethicists that really inform a little bit of how we think about what this new technology is. Looking into the future, I hope that if we fast forward five to ten years that we will have some sort of device or electroceutical that we can safely administer to, to, to patients. I think what really informed our underlying approach to research is the clinical experience that I had in grad school. I think what that made me realize is that there's a lot of really good technologies and ideas out there that really smart people develop that don't get implemented for the wrong reason. It's not that they don't work, it's that the people who it affects haven't been engaged enough to give their stamp of approval. What I really try to focus on is trying to understand what exactly is the problem that we're looking for and is our proposed solution going to make a difference? One, is it going to work? And that's all the engineering and thankfully we, you know, we work with really smart people that I'm fortunate to have in lab. But then there's the other question of, oh, well, how would this actually be implemented? Are patients agreeable to it? Would doctors prescribe it? Are we asking a nurse to take you know, an extra five minutes per patient out of their busy day to do it? Which is a pretty tall ask if you wanted to do that. This is really where the interdisciplinarity comes in, in terms of being able to talk with people and understand exactly what their perspective on a potential solution is.